each and every one of you. We want to welcome you uh, to Destiny Fellowship. Thank you for being a part of our worship time. Thank you for coming back to hear the word of the Lord. Uh, we're excited because we know God has a word of encouragement for your life and the people that are connected to you, the people that are in your life. Uh, we want to ask you if you would take a moment before we begin to um, not only like the page or uh, like this post, but uh, help us share this post so that we can reach others as well. Also, I want to take a moment and encourage you to get your Bible, get a notepad, uh, turn off the TV if you need to, if you need to go in uh, to another room, do whatever you've got to do so that we can be prepared and set our hearts and our minds to receive the word of the Lord. We've been in a series at Destiny Fellowship on the parables of Jesus. And this morning we're going to continue. Uh, we'll be in Mark chapter 13 in just a few moments. That is Mark chapter 13. Once more, I want to welcome all of you who are connecting. Uh, let's get into the word of the Lord. I'll be reading in Mark 13 verses 32 through 37. Uh, would somebody help us in the comment section, please, uh, posting Mark 13, verses 32 through 37. Come on, let's read it together, regardless of whatever translation you have. The scriptures say, But of that day or hour no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but the Father alone. He says in verse 33, Take heed, stay alert, for you do not know when that appointed time will come. It is like a man away on a journey, who upon leaving his house and putting his servants in charge, he assigned to each one his task, also commanded the doorkeeper to stay on the alert. Therefore, be on the alert, for you do not know when the master of the house is coming, whether in the evening, at midnight, or when the rooster crows, or in the morning, in case he should come suddenly and find you asleep. Verse 37 says, what I say to you, I say to you all, be on the alert. Uh, this morning I want to preach for a little while using as a subject, ready or not, here I come. Ready or not, here he comes. We've been in the series on parables. We started two weeks ago looking at the parable of the soils. We saw that the sower sows the word of God on different types of ground. It lands on the wayside, it lands on the thorns, it lands among stones, and then we see it lands on good ground. Last week we saw that not only are good seeds being sown, but there is an enemy who is sowing bad seeds. We saw this in the parable of the wheat and the tares. We saw that while men slept, the enemy sowed, and one day the Lord will separate between the wheat and the tares. Today in this parable, we're going to continue to elaborate on this theme. I've already shared that in most of the parables of Christ, each parable is not only connected, but many of them build on the previous parables. We've chosen to study the parables not only because they contain spiritual insights for our life, but most of the parables have strong implications for the last days. I don't know about you, but it is evident that we are in fact living in the last days. As you study the last days in theology, there's a branch called eschatology. It is the study of the end times. And one of the chief doctrines of the last days or the end times is the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, the second coming of Jesus Christ. One author noted that the second coming of Christ is such an important doctrine in the New Testament. He discovered that every one in 25 verses of the New Testament is about the second coming of Jesus Christ. Of the 260 chapters in the New Testament, it's interesting that the second coming is mentioned 318 times in the New Testament. Virtually every New Testament book mentions the second coming of Jesus Christ, with the exception of Galatians and 2nd and 3rd John. We can also see that here in Mark 13, Jesus is giving a strong emphasis on his second coming and on his return. In fact, if you, as you peruse through the chapter, you'll notice a couple of points. For example, you'll see in Mark 13 and verse uh, 24, he says that he comes with the clouds. He comes with the clouds. He's alluding to a passage in the book of Daniel, but he explains, when I come back, when I come back for my people, he says, I'm coming with the clouds. 
You'll see later in the chapter here in verse 36, he says, not only does he come in the clouds, it says he comes suddenly. He comes quickly. He comes suddenly. He comes unexpectedly. Uh, The scriptures portray it as a thief coming in the night when you aren't ready, when you aren't looking for him. So not only does he come in the clouds in this chapter, not only does he come suddenly, but if you notice again, verses 32, 33, and 34, they each say the same thing, that we don't know when he's coming. He comes in the clouds, he comes suddenly, and no man knows the day or the hour of exactly when he is coming. The conclusion the Lord gives us is that since we don't know when, we are to always be ready. That was a good place to say amen. Since we don't know the day or the hour, we are to always be ready for the Lord's return. And so the phrase that is used here is simply take heed. Take heed. Your your translation might say it a little bit different, but uh, it's the same. In all of this chapter, we see this used over and over again. He says, take heed. And so this morning, I want to give you three verbs found in this parable of the householder. Three verbs on how we are to take heed, how we can be ready for the Lord's return. Here's the first word. I need you to say it with me. Simply watch. Watch. It it, it may say watch in your Bible. You may have a different translation. Uh, But regardless, again, in the original text, you see watch over and over again in Mark 13. If you have your Bible open, I want you to take a quick tour with me through this chapter. We're in Mark 13 and verse 5. Notice what it says. And Jesus said to them, see to it. Watch. Jump down to verse 9. He says, but be on your guard. In Greek, it's the word blepo. Blepo is to see or to watch. Jump down to verse 23, please. Verse 23 says, but take heed. Watch. Look at verse 33 take heed. He says it again in the verse, stay on the alert, keep on the alert. Look at verse 34. He says to the servants, stay on the alert. Verse 35, be on the alert. Are you getting this? Look at verse 37, be on the alert. My dear brothers and sisters, at least eight times in this chapter, Jesus says to the crowd that is listening to him, he says, watch, be alert, stay on guard, don't fall asleep, be vigilant. In the parable of the householder, the master has gone on a journey and he tells the servants and specifically he says to the porter, he says, keep watch, be on guard, look out. What does that mean for us? It means that in order for us to be ready for the Lord's Lord's return, we are to take heed. How do we do that? First thing is we watch and we look. What does that mean? It means we look forward to his return. The Bible explains over and over that that we are to eagerly await the Lord's return. It's not something that we dread. It's something we look forward to. It's something we we long for. In fact, the book of Revelation says we are to say with the spirit and the bride, come. We are to say, Maranatha, even so, Lord, come. But we don't just look forward to it. We look for it. We look for it the day of the Lord. We look for the coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I need to give you some scriptures to back this up. In Titus chapter 2 and verse 13, it says, looking for that blessed hope, the appearing of our God and our Lord Jesus Christ. He says, we're looking for it. We're looking for his appearing. We're looking for the blessed hope. In Philippians chapter 3 and verse 20, Paul says almost the same thing again. He says, we look for our Savior. We look for the Lord Jesus Christ. I need you to take notes with me here. I'm in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 12 through 14. 2 Peter 3 and verse 12, watch this. He says that we are to be looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God. We are to look for the day of God. But the next verse in verse 13, he says, and we are to look for a new heaven and a new earth. In verse 14, he says, we are to look for these things. All right, I know I gave you a lot, but let's go through it again one more time. In verse 12, we're in 2 Peter 3. In verse 12, Peter says that we look for the coming of the day of God. In verse 13, he says, we look for a new heaven and a new earth. In verse 14, he says, we are to look for these things. And I don't know about you, but if we can be honest this morning, we understand we should be looking for his return 
We should be like that porter on watch who's, who's looking. When are you coming, God? We're ready. Our house is in order. And yet sometimes it's so easy to be distracted by the cares of this world, by the things happening in our life. Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't be concerned with those things. I'm saying don't remember that in order for you to, don't forget, in order for you to take heed, we are to look for his return. My youngest daughter just started driver's ed and I was counting. I'm embarrassed to say I remember 25 years ago uh, when I was in driver's ed. I remember in one class they put a VHS tape on and they showed us about eight buses in two rows. There was enough space between these rows of buses for a vehicle to pass through and not a whole lot of extra space at all. And in this video they were showing us, they had different drivers get into the same vehicle one at a time. And they were trying to see who could go and drive between these rows of buses the fastest. The first few drivers were about the same. They would carefully look and make sure they weren't hitting the front end or hitting the mirrors on the side or scraping the edge of the car. And they carefully went through until they got to one driver who from start to finish, he simply sped right between both rows of buses. Immediately when he gets out the car, they ran to him and asked him, how did you do it? How did you maneuver? How did you drive between the buses so effectively? Here's his answer. He said, I just kept looking towards the end. He said, I just kept looking towards the end. And I want to encourage you, my dear brothers and sisters, it's very easy to get distracted in this day in which we're living. I want to remind you, look towards the end. Look towards the finish line. Keep your eyes on the prize. No wonder the author of Hebrews says, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. We can be honest again, we would realize that it's so easy to take your eyes off of the prize. It's so easy to start looking at other things and concentrating on other things. And in this walk called Christianity, many times it's easy to lose focus. I want to remind you, I need to encourage you this morning. Set your eyes on Christ again. Put your gaze on the Lord Jesus Christ. Refocus, realign yourself if you have to. Remember that we are to take heed by watching, looking unto the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I'm not saying we we shouldn't be involved and shouldn't be concerned with things happening in our world. That is our reality. Perhaps a metaphor to explain it is in a minnow-type fish called the four-eyed fish. Uh, Look it up. It's called the four-eyed fish. It's found in Central America and South America. And if you're not careful, you'll mistake it for an alligator. Even though it's very small, it's interesting because as it swims, it has these two large bulging eyes on the top of its head that stick out of the water. And really, that's all you can see as he's swimming, his eyes sticking out of the water. Uh, But this fish has been created so uniquely that his eyes are actually split in half so that it gives him an illusion of wearing bifocals. That as the fish is swimming, watch this, he's able to look above the water while simultaneously being able to look below the water. Let me say that again. The four-eyed fish can look above and beneath at the same time. And I want to encourage you that as we live in this difficult season here in 2020, we are to set our eyes on Christ. We are to set our affection on things to come. And yet at the same time, we are not to be ignorant of what is happening around us. We are to look above and beneath at the same time. But don't get get distracted. Uh, Don't be discouraged by what's happening around us. If, If all you see are issues, if all you see are politics, if all you see is pain, if all you see is things happening around us, boy, it's easy to get discouraged. It's, it's easy to allow doubt to set in. It's, it's easy to get depressed and anxious and afraid. No wonder Paul said, set your eyes on things that are above, set your affection, set your heart on things that are eternal, and don't get caught up in the things that are temporary. First of all, we see in order to take heed, we are to watch. Here's the second thing. I'm in Mark chapter 13 and verse 33. Secondly, he says we are to pray. 
we are to pray. Would you say that with me? Pray. In fact, let's put them both together. The first thing we do is watch. And secondly, we pray. Isn't that what Jesus said to his disciples in the garden? He said, watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. I realize that some of your translations may not include the word pray in verse 33. After close research, I realized that some of the best manuscripts are very intentional about including the Greek word for prayer here, prosuchamai, prosuchamai. And you can find King James and several other translations. Don't just say watch or be on guard or be on the, the alert, but it says watch and prosuchamai. It says watch and pray. It's very interesting to me that in this parable, Jesus says this is how you take heed. And of all of the spiritual disciplines he could have mentioned, notice that Jesus simply did not say, watch and read your Bible, watch and go to church, watch and praise, watch and worship. All of those things are important. But notice he said, this is how you take heed, watch and pray. Why prayer? My dear brothers and sisters, he said prayer because prayer is the lifeline of the Christian believer. Prayer is what vivifies the Christian. It's what enlivens us. It's what animates us. It's what gives us strength. It's what gives us faith. It's what gives us the vision. It's what gives us direction. It's what draws us closer to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In other words, Christ is saying, if you want to stay alert, if you want to stay sober, if you want to stay vigilant, he says, pray. Man, it's so simple, and yet it's so profound at the same time. He's giving us a timeless key on how to guard your spiritual life, and it's those four letters, P-R-A-Y. Friends, you've got to pray. You've got to pray. Many times when somebody begins to drift away from God, prayer is the first thing to go. Let me say that one more time. When people begin to separate from God, when you're not as close to him as you used to be, oftentimes prayer is the first thing we stop doing. Maybe because we're, we, we feel guilty or maybe we don't know what to say or maybe we don't want to talk to him because we know we're drifting away. But whatever reason, if you want to stay awake, if you want to watch, he said, pray. It's very intentional of all of the Greek words Christ could have used for prayer. He chose prosuchamai. It was Pastor Brian Bell who explains that this isn't just any Greek word for prayer. It is very intentional. It is very specific. Brian Bell explains this word describes the attitude of the soul in worship. You see, this isn't the kind of prayer where, where you just pray because you need something. This isn't the kind of prayer where uh, you're praying because you got in trouble. No, this is the yearning of the soul. Uh, this is prostration of the soul before the very presence of God. This is you putting your cell phone aside and shutting the door and getting alone with God and saying, Lord, I just want to talk with you. God, I just want to spend some time with you. That, that's prosuchamai. That, that's talking with God. That is prayer. And that's what helps you take heed and be ready for the master's return. Man, I wish y'all were in this room with me. You see, Psalm 42 describes this prosuchamai. He said, as the deer pants after the water, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. You see, that's the yearning, the longing of the soul. This isn't just now I lay me down to sleep. This isn't just, Lord, thank you for this food. This isn't just, Lord, help me today. This is the longing of the spirit of man, craving and desiring the spirit of God. It's what the psalmist would say in Psalm 42, deep cause unto deep. At the noise of your water spouts, all your waves and all your billows have gone over me. What's he describing? He's describing that close, intimate relationship that you can have with your creator through the power of prayer. Hallelujah. Somebody say amen. This is Psalm 63, verse 8, where the psalmist says, My soul follows hard after you, O God. Other uh, translations say, My soul is pursuing you. My soul is chasing you through prayer. I'm, I'm not praying because I have to do this. I'm not praying because this is what good Christians are supposed to do. No, I'm praying because I want to be with you. I'm, I'm praying because I want to know the God who saved me. I'm, I'm praying because I desire to know who you are and what you're like and how I can be closer to you. That's Prasukhamai. 
The great preacher G. Campbell Morgan said, watching is sleepless vigil of the God-desiring soul. Watching is sleepless vigil of the God-desiring soul. So I'm not just watching because I'm a spiritual insomniac. No, I'm watching and praying, he says, because my soul desires God. That's why we look forward to his return. It's not that we can't wait to see all these things in the book of Revelation take place. It's it's not about the mark of the beast. It's not about Babylon, the mystery. It's simply about the day coming when we shall see him as he is and we shall know him even as we are known. That, That ought to rise. That ought to stir something up inside of your spirit. In fact, in the Song of Solomon, the bride is waiting on her beloved to come. You see, in that book, the bride is a picture of me and you. It's a a picture of the church, and she's, she's waiting. She's longing to see him. And finally, when she hears his voice, and finally, when she sees his hand through the crack in the door, my Bible says her bowels were aroused for her beloved. Her bowels were aroused. You don't hear that in many of our worship songs, but it's a way of saying everything in her was moved for her master. Does that describe your relationship with God? That everything inside of you desires to be closer to him. Those are the kind of people I like to worship with. Those are the kind of people I like to work with. Those are the kind of people and pastors I like to network with. People who they are more concerned about getting closer to God and everything in us is moving towards him. When that's you, nobody has to beg you to share a sermon. Nobody has to remind you to give your tithes and offerings. You don't get discouraged if somebody from the church doesn't call you every day because you recognize my eyes are fixed on him. I got to hurry, but watch this. If you want to take heed and be ready for the master's return, first and foremost, we watch. Secondly, we pray. I've got just one more and then I'll get out of your way. Thirdly, I'm in verse 34, Mark 13 and verse 34. If you're just joining us, we are to work. You see in the parable of the householder, it says in verse 34, the master went away on a journey. And when he left, he left his servants and he gave them authority. I realize some translations may not have the word authority in English, but it's there in the Greek. It's exousia. It says he gave them authority. But the next part, I want to read it in verse 34. The Nasby says, and he assigned to each one his task. Again, what are we to be doing while we wait for the Lord's return? We are to watch. We are to pray. We are to work. Come on, will you say that with me? Watch, pray, and work. If you're wondering, what am I supposed to be doing with my life? Watch, pray, and work. What should I be doing right now? Watch, pray, and work. I love the fact that it says he gave them authority and he gave them work. Authority and work. That should remind you of Genesis chapter 1. It should have triggered something in you. You remember Genesis 1 and verse 28, because when God created Adam and Eve, he places them in the garden and he gives them two things. The first two gifts God gave to man, Genesis 1, 28, he gave man dominion. Verse 29, God gives man seed, dominion and seed. Why dominion? So that man could have authority. Man could have exousia. Verse 29, God gives him the seed. Why a seed? So that now he can work the land. This is the same thing Christ is relating in the parable of the householder in Mark 13. He says, the master has gone away. You don't know when he's coming back, but while you're waiting, he's given you authority. He's given you power and he's given you an assignment. He's given us a task. He's given us a work to do. I need to clarify here that at Destiny Fellowship and most Christians that I'm aware of are of the strong conviction that this isn't just for pastors and preachers and planters of churches. We are of the strong conviction that every Christian is called to be a worker, serving in the kingdom of God, busy about the master's business. In fact, we can go further. We are of the strong conviction that every Christian is an evangelist. Every Christian should be a disciple maker. Every Christian is a missionary. I wish I had some help in here this morning. Every Christian is called to serve and to work in the body of Christ. How do you know that? Look at verse 37. Look at what Jesus says. What I say to you, I say to who? 
to all. You see that? He wasn't just talking to these great 12 apostles. He said, what I'm saying to you, I'm saying to all Christians, I've given you authority and I've given you an assignment. I've given you a work to do. Are you busy about the master's business or are you simply in survival mode during this pandemic? And I don't blame you if you are. I understand completely, but I just want to rattle us a little bit and remind us. I want to shake us up. Remind us, watch, pray, and don't stop working in the kingdom of God. In fact, don't even wait till we get back to the sanctuary in just a few weeks. You ought to be working right now. You ought to be making disciples. You ought to be serving You ought to be a blessing to somebody else right now. You ought to be sowing into somebody. So I'm reminded of the great reformer, John Calvin. He was known for his just fast and furious pace of serving and working. Some believed even to the detriment of his own health. He just didn't stop serving and working and preaching and serving and ministering. That was John Calvin. And yet at the end of his life, Many of his friends came around him and they urged him to slow down. They understood what he was doing, but but they saw what was happening to his own health. And they said, John, we need you to slow down. We need you to chill. I love his response. I'm not saying we should work ourselves to death. We are to be wise in that. But I, I need to remind you that we are to be working. I love John Calvin's response. He said to his friends, would you have my master find me idle. He looked at the room and said, would you have the master find any of us idle? I don't know about you, but when he returns, I want to be found working. I want to be found serving. I want to be found with a towel in my hand, serving the least of these. The Bible says in Matthew 20, Four in verse 46, blessed is the man who, when his master returns, he finds him working. And my sincere question is, if the Lord were to return today, would he find you watching? Would he find you praying? Would he find you working? We've got a job to do. We've got souls and friends and family members to evangelize. We've got believers that need to be discipled. We've got work to do. And so in conclusion... Most of you are aware that just two days ago, a famous actor passed away, Chadwick Boseman, uh, who many of you identify as the Black Panther. And if you remember the movie, The Black Panther, it takes place in the fictional country of Wakanda. If you remember in the movies or even in the comic books, Wakanda was so far ahead in technology And yet there was this huge bubble shield protecting the country because they didn't want to share their knowledge with the rest of the world. I wonder how many times as believers we forget that you and I have the most important knowledge. We have the most important information. We have the most important message. And yet for whatever reason, oftentimes we don't share it with the rest of the world. I want to be found watching. I want to be found praying. I want to be found working. In fact, I want to pray with you even right now. Wherever you're at, wherever you're at whatever you're doing, if you're able to, unless you're driving, everybody else, would you just shut everything down for a moment? Come on, it's Sunday morning. This is our service right now. Can we just talk to God? And As I've been asking you these last few weeks, I'll lead us, but I want to encourage you, have a conversation with the Lord. Make sure your house is ready. Make sure your heart is ready. And let's pray uh, on these points that we have just shared. Come on, let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for your word. Thank you that you wake us up and you tell us and remind us to watch. God, I pray for everyone connected right now, everyone that will watch later. In the name of Jesus, God, stir up our prayer lives. Forgive us, forgive me for prayerlessness. And Lord, bring us back. Draw us back into a close relationship. Help us guard our prayer life and our prayer habits, God. Renew the joy of our salvation. Bring us back to our first love, those those days and those times when we couldn't wait to talk to you. We couldn't wait to pray. We couldn't wait to worship. We couldn't wait to get alone with you, God. We want to be found praying. 
Lord, we want to be found working. We acknowledge you have given us an assignment. You have given us a ministry. God, I pray that we would be diligent with what you have entrusted to us, that when you do return, God, we would be found watching and praying and working. Lord, I pray as we study piece by piece eschatology, Lord, provoke us to evangelism. Let it create an uneasiness in us that we've got to tell others. We've got to make disciples. We've got to win the loss. God, we've got to multiply churches and multiply disciple makers. Father, we pray for every family connected right now. We pray for our loved ones. We pray for unsaved husbands, unsaved wives, unsaved children, unsaved parents. Lord, we call out to you in the name of Jesus. We ask you, be gracious, be merciful, stir their hearts, bring conviction in their lives, Lord, that they would respond to your gospel message. Use others. Lord, we ask, use us to be a blessing to them. Use us as your instruments to draw them to you, Father, and to lead them to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We look forward to your return. We say Maranatha in the name of Jesus Christ. And all of God's people said, Amen and Amen. God bless you, friends, church. Thank you for joining us today. We pray you have been blessed by our message. We pray you've been blessed by our time together in worship. Uh, We'll be returning back to our sanctuary in uh, Willowbrook, Northwest Houston in about two to three weeks. We're meeting with our leaders and uh, making those preparations. But until then, your church is here to serve you. We pray you're also a part of what God is doing in these last days. God bless you. Have a wonderful afternoon.